Before we begin our study of Unit 2 and gases, I think it's important to revisit our model of matter so far. Everything that we've studied and stated about matter is in line with the early ideas of Democritus, who is, was a Greek philosopher and the first person credited with recording observations of matter. His first observation is that matter is composed of particles which move through empty space. We too, as a team, have been uh, documenting matter as composed of small circular particles and with the popcorn demonstration as well as the hot and cold water demonstration we have evidence that particles can move. His second point is that particles are solid, homogeneous, indestructible, and indivisible. We have also been drawing our particles as colored in solid circles. They are the same throughout, meaning homogeneous, and we've yet to try to destroy a particle or divide a particle into smaller pieces. His third observation of matter is that different types of particles are gonna be different sizes and shapes. We too, when drawing particle diagrams, show different types of matter, either with different colored particles or different shapes. Lastly, Democritus felt that the size, shape, and movement of particles determines the properties of matter. We have seen evidence of this as well, in that a particle of air behaves differently than a particle of water, which behaves differently than a particle of carbon dioxide. Now we're ready to add to this model of matter through the study of gases. Gases comes from the word, uh, Latin word which, of chaos, which means space. And even in our first unit on density, because we saw the density was so small, we could see that there is a large amount of space or volume between particles of gases. There's been much research into the behavior of gases, and this research has been put into what's called the kinetic particle theory. Kinetic means relating to or resulting from motion. So these five points that we're going to look at are used to describe how the motion of gas particles can explain the behavior of gases. Point one, if we think back to the popcorn diffusion demonstration, there didn't really appear to be a pattern or a path for the pop popcorn particle smell movement. Even though more individuals close to me raised their hands sooner than those that were further away from the popcorn smell, we could still see that there were some people that smelled it in the second row before those in the first or someone in the fourth row even before the second row. So even though there was a definite pattern of spread, there wasn't a pattern necessarily. This is in line with point one of the kinetic particle theory, and that is that particles of gas are in a constant but random pattern of motion. And gas particles tend to move in straight lines until they collide with another particle or a wall of the container in which they're enclosed. So even though we couldn't see the popcorn smell particles, um, they were just moving about in straight lines until they would hit another popcorn smell, if they would hit a particle of air, or hit the walls of our classroom or one of you. Point two in the kinetic particle theory um, has to do with gas movement and energy. If we think about what would happen if gas particles ever did stop moving or ran out of energy. Any particle without energy stays still and so those gas particles would most likely fall to the floor. We know this isn't true because the gas particles we need to breathe, namely oxygen, are constantly spread throughout our environment. Point two demonstrates this observation. Particles of a gas experience what are called elastic collisions. Now this term might seem confusing because it's not elastic like a rubber band, but what it means is that these particles, they constantly run into each other, but they don't ever lose the energy they possess. They just transfer it to the particle or the container that they run into. So they'll constantly be moving because they're constantly running into other particles and picking up more energy. Point three of the kinetic particle theory, again, we can think back to the popcorn. We didn't, it didn't appear like the particle smells stuck together. They actually spread throughout the room. So we didn't see any evidence that the particles were attracted to each other or trying to get towards each other. 
they didn't they didn't appear to be repelled by each other either like trying to get away and point three is in line with these observations particles of a gas do not stick to each other and actually because they're so far apart and their density is so low they're not attracted or repelled to one another they just move about independently in a straight line and when they collide they move off into another direction Point four goes back to our hot and cold water demonstration in that all particles are not moving at the same speed. And we saw how we could make particles move faster or slower. Uh, individual particles moving at, move at different speeds because they have different amounts of energy. And even though there are different ways to supply or take away energy, typically the speed is going to be related to temperature or heat energy. And so this uh, diagram, which is also in your notes, shows this difference in speed based on different energies. The particles in the container on the left are moving about randomly, hitting the sides of the container. But we can see the particles on the right, while doing the same, are moving faster and striking harder because they have a greater amount of energy. The final point of the kinetic particle theory has to do with gas pressure. Uh, we will be doing a lab very shortly where we quantify and look for relationships with gas pressure. So we need to understand, well, what causes it? The pressure of a gas is directly related to how often and how hard the gas particles collide with each other as well as the sides of the container in which they're enclosed. So that's really what we're measuring with gas pressure, how often and how hard are the particles colliding. So that brings us to a discussion on gas pressure. If you look up a definition, any type of pressure is how much force there is per unit of area. Uh, so again, gases exert pressure when they hit each other and the sides of their container, and that produces a force. Now the force, we can change the amount based on the, uh, the area that the force is being applied. A good example of this would be if you looked at the two different types of shoes here in the corner. If I wear tennis shoes or flat shoes to work, my body weight is dispersed over the entire you know, bottom of my foot, and so I don't feel as much force on my feet. If I wear high heels to school, though, now my body weight is concentrated over a much smaller area, the, the toes and then the uh, heel portion of the shoe, and so I'm going to feel a lot more force on my feet. So this whole idea of gas pressure and force, if we decrease the amount of area over which the force is applied, the pressure is increased. Another example of this would be if you were walking across a frozen pond and the ice started to crack. If you remain standing, all of your body weight is over one point, your feet. But if you were to lay down on the ice, this disperses your body weight over a greater area and you're less likely to crack through the ice. Now a specific type of gas pressure that we can measure and that affects our daily lives is atmospheric pressure, which is exerted on the earth by the atmosphere. Now there's pressure is different at different points on our earth because of the sea level of the, or the location. Standard pressure is the normal pressure at sea level. So if we go to a city that is high above sea level, such as in Colorado, we're going to see a different pressure. Same thing if we go to a city below sea level like New Orleans, there's going to be a different pressure. So when we're comparing to normal, it's the pressure at sea level. Now when we were measuring mass, we had a unit of grams, and then volume had a unit of milliliters or cubic centimeters. Pressure has three different units of measurement that we'll be using. Um, it can be measured in atmospheres, and the standard pressure is 1.0, and we abbreviate that ATM. It can also be me measured in kilopascals, and the standard pressure would be 101.3, and we abbreviate that KPA. And the final measure of pressure is milliliters of mercury, millimeters, excuse me, of mercury. Um, this form of pressure, millimeters of mercury, is the same unit of pressure used when you get your blood pressure taken at the doctor's office. So when they report a pressure of 120 over 80, the units of that would be millimeters of mercury. We're going to use the kinetic particle theory and those five points to explain how gases behave. The first explanation, though, we already know a great deal about, which is density from the first unit. 
we know that density is the amount of mass per unit of volume. And we, as we look back at the kinetic particle theory, there's a lot of space between gas particles. This leads to a much lower density when we compare gases to other states of matter. Another behavior we can explain is the idea of compression and expansion. Because there's such a large amount of space between the particles, it's a lot easy, to, or it's very easy, to squish them into a smaller volume. However, if we remove that force, the particles, because they're constantly moving, are going to push back and expand to fill the available space of their container. This diagram illustrates this idea of compression and expansion. If we were to push down on the piston in the center, because of the space between the gas particles, we can squeeze them into a smaller volume. However, if we remove that force entirely, those motion of the gas particles are going to spread out to fill the available volume of their container. As we saw in another point in the kinetic particle theory, there isn't any uh, significant force of attraction between gas particles. Because of this, they can flow very easily past one another. This uh, behavior can explain two types of um, qualities of gases, which is diffusion and effusion. Diffusion we saw with the popcorn particles. If we have the popcorn the small particles partitioned inside the bag, you can see there's a high concentration of particles. As soon as we open the bag or remove this partition, the popcorn particles, because they're moving, are going to collide and spread out to fill the available container. So diffusion is the tendency of gas particles to move from a high concentration area to a low concentration until they're spread out evenly through the system. You may also have learned about diffusion across a cell membrane in biology. Another property of gases based on this idea that they are able to flow past one another is effusion. And this is the movement of gas particles through a tiny opening into a region of lower pressure. The best example of this is a hole in a balloon. Again, if we look at the box, if this is representative of the balloon, the particles inside are under an area of high pressure. If we poke a hole in the balloon, we all know that the air is going to escape. But the reason is because the particles are going from an area of high pressure to an area of lower pressure. Another example would be if you poke a hole in a bike tire or an air tire. Now not all particles diffuse or move at the same rate. Particles that are smaller or have less mass are going to diffuse more quickly than if we have very massive particles. Because gas particles are so small and we're unable to see them, we're going to use this in, uh, animation to review the points of the kinetic particle theory. We have a closed container here connected to a bicycle pump, and if we pump the handle, we're going to force some air particles into the container. If you watch the particles for a moment, you can see evidence of point one of the kinetic particle theory. These gas particles are constantly moving, they move in a straight line until they hit another blue particle or the side of the container. We also see evidence of point two in this idea of elastic collisions. These particles, even if we watch them for an hour or two hours, would continue to move. When they hit each other, they transfer energy, and so that they exhibit that idea of elastic collisions. Point three, we can see that the particles don't ever appear to stick together, they're not attracted to each other, nor are they trying to push away or repel from each other. They just move around independently, not really caring about the particles next to them. All these particles right now appear to be moving at the same speed. If I wanted to get them to move faster, I could add energy in the form of heat. And if we watch as the temperature rises on the thermometer, the particles move faster in the container. If I were to remove heat energy by putting them on ice, again the temperature falls and I can see that the particles are moving more slowly. The final point of the kinetic particle theory is, has to do again with gas pressure, which is caused by the particles hitting each other and the sides of the container. And we can see that pressure registered on the gauge here at 0.6, or it's jumping around a little bit, but about 0.7 atmospheres or ATM.